Professor, let's start at the beginning. Um, my first question is, what was your family like? Was this the kind of family of somebody who was going to make a career um, in engineering? Okay, I, I was born uh, in Seattle, Washington in 1939, uh, just before the Second World War. And the world was, was different in those days. Uh, ne neither of my parents actually finished high school. Uh, and my, my father was an illegal immigrant and worked, worked for half of minimum wage. And we were a very poor family, but I didn't know it. Right. Uh, I thought in my mind, I thought we were middle class or upper middle class. Right, right. Uh, but one thing that was important is my mother and father loved each other. And I never once heard either one make a negative comment about the other. And I think in their life, what they wanted is for me to have a better life than they did. And so early in my career, uh, they talked about education. And uh, I sort of had a to-do list wondering what one does. Well, first of all, are you an only child? No, I had an older brother and sister, which was fortunate. Uh -huh. Because they, they were three years older and they knew a lot more than I did. Uh, had they, and, along with the family, um, interest in education, even though they, yeah. uh, your parents had not been uh, educated very highly, were your, uh, bro were your brother and sister already trailing, uh, showing a way to go? Right, uh, because all, all three of us went to college. Ah. And in those days, I think a very small fraction of the population went to college. It, it wasn't essential. Right. Um, but uh, one of the things I, I should mention, I think I was very fortunate with my parents because there's a lot of research today that says uh, when a child is born, the neurons are present in the brain, but the wiring is very fluid. Yeah. And the first two years of a child's life is basically going to, to uh, determine how successful they are. Uh, if there's a stable environment and good nutrition, what the brain does in the first two years is it learns how to learn. And during life, up until you're about 21, it learns different things. You right. develop different skills. But I think my parents uh, really provided me with a very stable environment. Right. And because of that, uh, when I started elementary school, I noticed that I could learn faster, right. that I was, I was brighter than other kids. And I thought it was genetics, but I don't, I don't think that's true. I, I think it's the environment. Maybe I'm, I'm asking an old-fashioned question, but were there books in the home? Oh, yes. And my, my father, well, he would go to the library and check out books and read to me. The earliest I can remember, he would read books to me, and uh, they spent a lot of time. I mean, their life was seeing that their children had better lives than they did. I'm, I'm hearing a world of affection and concern, but not necessarily pushing you. I mean, no. it sounds like it was just a comfortable way to, to grow, right. but you were not, they were not determined that this happened or that you do this. Oh, yeah, there, were, there was no, I had no strategic plan in my life. Uh, I had a lot of fortunate things happen to me. Um, uh, initially, I went to kindergarten in a public school, uh, but my mother was a Catholic, and so uh, in the first grade, they moved me to a Catholic school. The Catholic school didn't have a kindergarten. That's why we didn't go there first. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I thought, oh, I wonder if I'm going to get a poorer education because there are professionals in the public schools and in the Catholic schools, there are these nuns. Right. Uh, but what I didn't realize is that people who study education understand what makes a good teacher is not how bright they are or how well educated, but it's whether they care about the success of their students. Right. And these teachers, by the way, uh, when they graduated from high school, went to this religious order because they wanted to teach. And they had, did not have college educations. Uh, and in fact, when I started college, two of my elementary school teachers <laughs> were in the same class I was because the religious order was trying to get their nuns sure. to have college education. I but, would also argue, uh, correctly or not, that their passion for what they were 
teaching oh. was as as important as their concern for you. Oh yes. And did they have that passion? Oh, they had a passion, and they wanted every student to learn. And I I, th I think I got just an outstanding elementary school education, uh, even though the teachers were not professional in any sense of the word. Were again, I I, I always wonder about direction and natural inclination. Were they directing the young in any particular direction that you remember? No, but they they were focused on every child learning. Okay. And I can remember in one grade, the, the teacher told me, she said, look, I've got to work with some of the people who are having trouble. Uh, why don't you just, there was a row of books by the windows. They said, why don't you just uh, read books uh, and you, you'll be okay. So I spent one year actually without lectures and so forth. Educating yourself in yeah. a way. Right. What books were you intrigued by and picking? Oh, and I would take the encyclopedia and I would just thumb through it and look at pictures and things like right. that. Uh, it wasn't that I was really learning, I was just enjoying myself. Let's, uh, let's take you to high school, maybe yeah. passing middle school, although that right. may have had a significant teacher. In oh, oh, well, no, we went, it was an eighth grade elementary school, and then I then, went to high school. high school. And there were two Catholic high schools, uh, but one was run by the Jesuits, and so my parents insisted on that one. It was a little bit the more... The order of learning. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it was very fortunate that uh, the, my algebra teacher when I was a freshman, was also the football coach. And you might ask, how could somebody who is a football coach be a good algebra teacher? But he really cared about students being successful. And I think that helped him both as a football coach and as an uh, algebra teacher. And in fact, somehow I didn't want to disappoint him. So I really studied. And um, and in fact, he passed away uh, back. And what I've done is I've established a, a scholarship in his, in his name, name because he had a profound impact on me. Uh, when I saw how well I could do in algebra, I thought maybe I could do that well if I studied other courses. And I was a good student before, but afterwards I was one of the top. Right. And uh, so it's, it was individuals in my life who cared about the success of others. And that's, that's why I went into teaching. Hmm. When I saw the success that other people could have, I wanted to be a teacher. And uh, so I went through high school. Right. Uh, then I went to Seattle University. Well, first of all, and, there was no yeah. question you were gonna go to university. Oh, no, no question. And, right. in, and in fact, I had asked you know, my parents, what do you do after high school? And they said, university. And I said, what do you do after that? And they said, graduate school. They didn't know what graduate school yeah, was. But, but. Uh, One other thing I should mention, uh, my, my father initially uh, worked at half of minimum wage just for, uh, yeah. as a janitor, yeah. uh, but then he became a citizen. And then all of a sudden he quit that firm and went to work for the uh, Power and Light Company uh -huh. at minimum wage. Uh, and he saw all of these draftsmen in white shirts with their sleeves rolled up, just drawing and having a cup of coffee. And he thought their life was much better than his. Right. And he thought they were electrical engineers. And so he said, John, you be an electrical engineer. Wow. Because I wouldn't have known what to major on in college. Right, right. I liked math and science. Right. So I would have taken something in engineering or science. In any case. But I decided, be electrical engineer. So because of the white coats. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you're in Seattle University. I'm sensing that you did not spend a lot of time looking at many universities. Oh, it never, it never occurred to me to look at another university. Uh, and oh, one of the things is I took an exam uh, for a scholarship to Seattle U. And I was one of the, I did very well on the exam and they interviewed five people for the scholarship. And when they interviewed us, a lot of the questions were about, how much do your parents earn? And I sort of knew, I'm gonna get that scholarship because the other people I knew lived in a better neighborhoods than right, I did right. and so forth. And sure enough, I got a four-year scholarship to Seattle U. Um, in those days, tuition, by the way, was $500 a year. Right, right. Uh, but one, that scholarship, it wasn't the money that was important but it was the message that was sent to me. And I didn't want to disappoint Seattle U because I, I had this scholarship. Right. 
And, and it's little things like that that affect a person's life. I, I have no doubt of that. And uh, I had good teachers uh, it, and small classes. There were only 20 people majoring in electrical engineering. Right. Uh, so you, you entered already knowing it would right. be electrical engineering. Right. Um, no temptation in any other field. No. No, no distraction by no. the idea of, of literature or of anything. It was no. electrical engineering. Right. Uh, as I said, I had no strategic plan. Right. And I sort of just did what I was told. Or, right. uh, and uh, I did, did very well. I was the top student. Okay. Uh, and I think I was the first engineering student to graduate summa cum laude. Really? Uh, and... Um, did you have to do a thesis or a culminating no. work at the end of your undergraduate? No, no, no. But one thing that did happen to me, I was going to then go to the University of Washington to get right. a PhD. And I went over and talked to a faculty member. And he said, well, look, we'll never admit you because you went to an unaccredited undergraduate institution. Mm -hmm. And actually, that was very fortunate that he said that because I went back to talk to my department chair and he said, why are you applying to the University of Washington? Huh. <laughs> why don't you apply to Stanford? So it was one condescension met yeah. another. Right. Yeah, I, I would have just applied to the University of Washington, nowhere else. Right. But I applied to Stanford. And they were delighted to take me. I had an NSF fellowship. and uh, So far I'm hearing uh, the context that's in a way lovingly pushing you forward. Right. Um, getting to Stanford... What were the expectations of what a graduate graduate work in electrical engineering be? What what kind of direction? Uh, would well, you have thought once again, I just went and I assumed you just look and see what courses you have to take and uh, what Did research. Did they specialize in a way as a as a school? Not at Stanford, not particularly at that. Point. Not particularly. Um, so I had an advisor and I asked, you know, what courses do you take? And you know, I just took them. And uh, it didn't, it wasn't too much. There was an exam, uh, you were sort of admitted, uh, and then you had to take an exam the first year to see if you would go on, could go on for a PhD. And I, I got past that exam. Right. But, but my advisor was in uh, more in the physical portion of electrical engineering, okay. laboratory work. Okay. And I took a laboratory course and I realized that was not for me. So I did make a decision to switch advisors that I realized that I was more mathematical, theoretical, and uh, s switched, I made that one switch. Right. Uh, but I, I just would not have succeeded I as an I, experimentalist. Now that I've got you in graduate school in electrical engineering, I know there's gonna be a thesis ahead or a, a right. doctoral direction. So. How does that come to be? What, what sends you in that direction? Well, you know, I wondered, I thought you had to do something fundamental, but it turns out I went to the library and I saw all the PhD theses in electrical engineering. Uh -huh. So I started to read a couple of them right. and I realized they weren't fundamental research. Uh, it was basically you did a project and write something up. Right. So then I realized uh, I'll, I'll just do a project and see if it's approved. What was it? Uh, well, I worked on threshold logic. Uh, Bernie Woodrow was uh, there, mm. and at that time uh, he was working on threshold logic, and it sounded interesting. Uh, they talked about learning theory. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the computing power wasn't available to do something significant. Uh, these are the dark ages. These were the dark ages. Right. And in fact, maybe I should back up when I was an undergraduate. Uh, I went to a lecture where somebody from the University of Washington was talking about programming the IBM 650. Okay. This was a machine with a rotating drum, uh, and uh, I think it had 2,000 words of memory. Uh, and then also uh, a, a physics professor at Seattle U, uh, asked me if uh, he could hire me to fix some program for him. And so I started, that's when I learned how to program. And program basically in machine language. Right. Uh, but Fortran was invented at that time. And so I rewrote the program in Fortran. 
And I realized you, in a couple hours, you could do what was taking me a month in machine language. Yeah. But, um, but you didn't fall in love yet with... Not, not yet, but at least I had the programming skills. Okay. And so when I was at Stanford and decided to work on threshold logic, uh, I could program a computer and Bernie Woodrow had one and it wasn't used much so when it wasn't used I could use it and program and uh, basically my thesis was develop some code for uh, programming threshold logic units. So in a way you're on your way in your career you just don't know where that's going to go. Right. Um, you I'm guessing do well uh, with your thesis. Well, it was it was accepted. <laughs> well, it was accepted, but at this point, in determining whether or not, because an electrical engineer can actually make real money in the real world, as oh. opposed to a professor, are you now wondering? No, no, which no, direction? no. No, in in those days, that probably wasn't true. Ah. Uh, but uh, I was planning on going back to CLU and teaching. Okay. Because uh, I saw the impact that people had on me, and I wanted to have that impact on other people. Right. And uh, by the way, I was not focused on research at all. Uh, I mean, Seattle, you wouldn't have had any, and, and I would have just gone back. But another accident occurred. I was walking past Bernie Woodrow's office, and he was on the telephone talking to Ed McCluskey at Princeton. Yes. And Ed McCluskey wanted to know if there was anybody that they might hire uh, in electrical engineering at Princeton. And Bernie said, come on in. And he handed me the phone and said, this is Ed McCluskey, <laughs> talk to him. <laughs> and on that phone call uh, conversation, Ed invited me back for an interview at Princeton. And I thought, well, why not go oh, and indeed. see what Princeton is like? So I went and uh, interviewed at Princeton and uh, Shortly after, I was offered a job. And so I thought, maybe what I should do is go. It was a three-year appointment as an assistant professor. Right, and, and I should mention, by the way, I had zero publications. Uh, that wouldn't even get you into graduate school now. That's right. uh, but based on the work that I had done, uh, Ed was willing to gamble and hire me. And I didn't realize you had to do research to get promoted. It was, it was only when I was a faculty member there huh. that I realized that. And uh, one thing, again, it's just luck. Uh, uh, my early career was built on my PhD students. Uh, I had PhD students at Princeton that were smarter than I was. Uh, several of them now are members of our National Academy and, and so on. And we were roughly the same age mm -hmm. and we worked together because they wanted to get their thesis and I wanted to get tenure. Right. Uh, and we worked jointly. Uh, but certainly you, at least as the head of this group, um, are pushing it in that direction? Not, 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 not really. I was only two, three years older. Right. And uh, Well, let me put it another way. You're educating yourself to be one step ahead of them, I would argue. Right. I, I did do one thing because uh, McCluskey knew that information and computer science was going to be important. Right. Uh, there were no computer science departments. And he said, John, teach a course in computer science for me. And I had to ask him, what does one teach in computer science? Because right. there were no courses, there were no books. And he gave me four papers, and he said, if you cover these papers, it will be a good course. And uh, so I taught this course, and the notes that I developed, uh, I made an arrangement with one of the graduate students that we would convert it into a book. And this book uh, became one of the most hundred reference books uh, in science and engineering. Right. And basically, as computer science department started, there's going to be a course, uh, this book was used all over the world and helped build my reputation. So you're president of the creation in a way of... <laughs> right. But unknowingly. Unknowingly. I understood. Uh, no. I, in my entire career was... And the other thing I didn't realize is that when McCluskey had me teach this course, it made me one of the world's first computer scientists. 
And when our government was looking for a senior computer scientist, even though I was not very old, I was on the short list. Mm -hmm. And that's why the first uh, Bush president asked me if I would be on the National Science Board, uh, which is the organization that funds science in, in and academia. You're what, at this point, 25, 26? Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to go back well, and look uh, to see how old I was. Right. Uh, but people, you know, ask me, "Wow, how did you get an appointment, a presidential appointment?" Uh, you know, and what I say is, you know, imagine if I had been in high energy particle physics, I'd still be waiting today for the senior faculty to ahead of me to retire. Right. But there were no senior faculty ahead of me. I, I and, would argue there are two things that happen in, in a life that build the kind of career you've had. One is luck, oh, no luck. question, yeah. but the second is response to the luck. Right. You know, I mean, if the opportunity is there, you still have to seize it. Right, but, but you know, this question of luck, so many lucky things happened to me. I wondered how that could possibly be, the probability, and I wonder if these kinds of events don't occur. If, if it hadn't been these, it would have been some other set. Right. And some people respond to them and some don't. Right. And I, I think there, there was something in my makeup that led me to respond. Because very early in my career, I was always curious. Yes. Uh, it's I was, really the history of your curiosity that I'm yeah. interested in. Yes. Uh, because, you know, if, I, if there was a woods and there was a path, I was curious where did it go? Right. And uh, most of the streets where I lived in Seattle lined up. They were rectangular. Mm -hmm. But where it starts to drop off to the lake, they were curved. And I wondered, if I took that street, would it curve around? Would it come out? Right. There's just many things like that. Uh, and uh, light switches. There was a hallway in my school that had a switch at either end. Right. And you could turn it on or off at either end. And I wondered, how is that why? How could that be? Yeah, so it just... My, my life was, was curiosity. Well, where does and, your curiosity now take you? You're, you've taught the course right. in computers. Uh, you've come up with the first textbook, <laughs> okay. if right. you will. Um, well, one, one of the things is uh, I realized I had to do research. And uh, Princeton had a good program that in your first three years, you could take a semester off. And so I took a semester and spent it at Bell Labs. And that's where I started to do some fundamental research. Uh, but there was a problem at Princeton. Um, Ed McCluskey was trying to build computer science because he knew it was important. He knew that that's where the future was. But it was hard to hire when there was a faculty slot open. He could not find really high quality people. He had to take gambles. But there was an area of information science, which was a well-established discipline. And the faculty member there could produce 10 high-quality applicants because every electrical engineering department in the US uh, taught information technology. And there were graduate students who couldn't get jobs. Right. And it was always a fight. Uh, between the faculty member in information technology and McCluskey, because the other faculty members were clearly better. But did we need more faculty in an area which was already developed and was probably dying? Right. Or should we gamble in an area that was the future? And did he win that? Uh, no, no. no. Uh, he and I both left after three years. Ah. He went to Stanford and I went to Cornell. Uh, and I was running the um, colloquium series at Princeton. And before, the people who ran it had local speakers. They didn't have money. And all they had was the money to uh, buy lunch or something for the local speaker. Right. But I looked at the amount, and there was enough money to have two speakers if you brought them from the East Coast. So I brought Noam Chomsky, uh. and, and I brought Uris Hartmanis. And, but I had to have, uh, had to have Hart Manis to our house for dinner because we didn't have, <laughs> I had used up all the, the food money, food money uh, for that. But um, Hart Manis was talking to me because he was building a department, a computer science department at Cornell. And uh, we were talking about how much they paid. And at Princeton, 
basically they paid you in reputation, not dollars. And uh, I happened to ask him, I said, how much would you offer me? And it was almost, it was 50% more than I was earning. And so I said, you know, I should go up for an interview. And I did, they made me an, an offer. And, and I realized that although Cornell wouldn't have quite as good students, it didn't have quite the same reputation as Princeton. The fact that I would be in a department where people recognized what I was doing, right. uh, it was probably better for me. Uh, at and, this point, roughly what time, what year is this? Uh, I was three years out of beyond my PhD. So, no, the, the, the uh, oh, year... Uh, uh, it would have been 67. 67. Um, Cornell has, in fact, at this point, established a computer. No, no. 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 So it's in electrical engineering that uh, right. you come to it, Cornell. Uh, no, no. Oh, at, at Cornell, they had computer science. They did. They, they did. Yes, no, I know Princeton uh -huh. did. But, but, yeah. So you actually go into a department... Of computer science. Of computer science. At this and, point, roughly, are there many in the country? No, or? this was the first one. The first one. And they had just started the year before. And so I could help them build the department and, and my career. Uh, Princeton then, uh, when they knew I was going to leave, they offered me a promotion to associate professor mm -hmm. to try to keep me to stay, but uh, I had made the decision to go. And So uh, at Cornell is one of the excitements, the establishment of, of a new field, if you will. Right. Uh, the, uh, the nature of your colleagues, were, were your colleagues exciting yeah, in it, some of the issues that you were interested right. in? Right, and, and uh, it was not going to be a political situation. Right. Uh, it would be people who would support and could evaluate quality. Can you give me a sense of the state of computer science or theory at this point in the late 60s when you go to Cornell? Well, when I went to Cornell, I think there were only three or four departments in the U.S. Right. And, but everybody was creating departments. Oh, and the department at Cornell was funded, uh, I forget the foundation, to train PhD students who would then be faculty in other universities. So the department had no undergraduate program. It was simply a PhD program, right, right. which was attractive. Would you have called yourself a theorist at this point? Yeah, I, I knew I was, I was more in theory. Yeah. And what were the theoretical issues that intrigued you? Well, um, there were things, finite automata, context-free languages and computability. Uh, context-free languages were interesting partly because of Noam Chomsky, but partly because programming languages, the syntax of them, could be represented by a context-free uh, grammar. And so I spent my initial time at Cornell uh, in this area of what we would call theoretical computer science. Okay. Uh, but in, in 1970, uh, I went on sabbatic and I went to Stanford. And I knew then that the area I was developing was not the future, that we had to have a much broader view of computer science. And so I switched to algorithms. Yes. And uh, while I was at uh, Stanford, uh, I developed a number, well, first of all, the, the thing which got me the, the Turing Award is that people measured how good a program was by the amount of time it ran on a computer. And the difficulty with that was when someone else, when someone published a paper, someone else would come along and have a better algorithm or claim a better algorithm and would publish their paper. But you didn't really know if it was better because first of all, the computer had become faster and you had to compensate for that. But the second author may have tuned his algorithm for the examples of the first author. And if you had tried these two algorithms on totally new problems, not clear. So I developed a mathematical technique called asymptotic complexity. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the asymptotic running time as the size of the problem increases? and worst case analysis. And uh, people kind of rejected this. Uh, yeah, I would have suspected that. It's <laughs> yeah. a little early to yeah, but, propose this. But, uh, and I gave a paper on it and people almost laughed me off the stage. 
But when I went back and I talked to Don Knuth, he immediately understood. And the bright people understood, and within a year, uh, people were switching to this metric. Just as a sidebar, do you find in the life of research a lot of naysaying happened right. along the way? Right. So if so, you need an element of your personality we haven't yet talked about, which is stubbornness. Is oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stubborn. Uh, and uh, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to work on it until I get it done. Because it's, you took so much direction in the best sense early on, but you're not just listening to others. Right. Uh, and whether they say this is a good idea or not. I mean, right. Right now you're launched. Right. As a thinker. Right. And even if they tell you it's nonsense, you're not. I'm going to do it anyway. You're going to do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is clearly path breaking. Yeah. Uh, this investigation into algorithms and so forth. Um, are you not tempted at this point to stay at Stanford and. Uh, no, no, questions? because uh, Ithaca was a good place to raise a family, huh? uh, and by this time we had three children, mm -hmm. and um, the nice thing about Ithaca, well, we bought a house, and we bought it on level ground so that the kids could ride their bicycles in the neighborhood within walking distance of an elementary school, um, and with a big front yard so they could play baseball, mm -hmm. things like this. and. We had a very nice environment. And Cornell was not shabby for intellectual environment. Yeah. So it's not that you were choosing this over that. It's just that between right. Stanford and Cornell, Cornell was comfortable. Right. Um, launching this investigation into fundamentals right. in computer theory, um, are you beginning to build a group of graduate students now that are... Oh, I, I only take on at most two. Even at this yeah, point? Right. This earlier point? Right. For the following reason. Okay. One of them I work with, and I may work with them 10 hours a week. Uh, the other one is maybe just starting and I don't have to spend too much time. But if I had a, two of them who were really deeply involved with me, how, would, how could I handle it? Right. Uh, I mean, my notion of working with a PhD student is you really form a partnership, right? And you're, you're going to do something. Colleague, more yeah. than yes. Now, if you're in an experimental area, then it would be a fundamentally different thing, because you would need people to set up equipment or, or yes. and, so, and so forth. But if you're really working theoretical, uh, you're a team of two, <laughs> uh, and so that's uh, I, I work. That's how I I work. Again, at every point, I'm going to ask you, what is the stage of computer thinking at this point? So uh, you've begun this inquiry. You're mocked a little bit, but eventually the world gets it. And right. how is the field expanding in, in, in your interests? Well, uh, I, I created a course in algorithms okay. at, at Cornell. And I th but I think it took a couple of years. Oh, and then wrote a book on algorithms. Okay. And, and then that book caused a lot of other universities to create similar courses. And this book also became one of the 100 most frequently referenced books in right. engineering and science. And it created the area of algorithms around the world. Uh, I didn't realize in either case that this is what would happen. I just, uh, so when I was an undergraduate, mm -hmm. uh, I read a book by Skilling and I thought, he, that made his reputation. And so I thought I would write a book. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't realize the impact the book was going to have. It did, in fact, make yeah. your reputation. <laughs> right, <laughs> but, right. Um, so now is algorithm bec becoming the framework in which most computer discussion is happening? Right, yes. yes. This, this was for, for a number of years. We're, we're before, and this is only because we don't have so much time that I'm racing, we're before the formal uh, framing of theory within the context of artificial intelligence, right? Right. This, well, this phrase doesn't even emerge yet. Right. No, artificial intelligence was uh, kind of frowned on still at this stage because there was a lot of hype, but very little results. Right. And um, this was also, at this time, people were trying to make computers useful. And so computer science was focused on that. But 
uh, sometime maybe 1980 or something, computers were useful. And now computer science is starting to focus on what are they used for. Mm -hmm. And uh, what used to be computer science, I think, is changing in a fundamental way. Uh, we're now going to start working with other departments. We were very insular for a, quite a while. But now, uh, an area which used to be called scientific computing is going to become an important area. Uh, it's sort of applied math. Mm -hmm. And people are looking in finance, in biology, in medicine, in economics, in any area, and seeing how, what the computer problems are and what is the underlying theory that needs to be developed. And uh, this it, is parallel with, well, I know it is circumstantially, but fundamentally with the increasing capacity of, that the technology can, right. can demonstrate? Right. Now that the, there is the computing capacity, uh, AI all of a sudden be has become very important. And it's uh, doing things um, now which are better than humans. Right. Uh, but I'm not going to let you get there yeah. yet. Um, we're, we're, we're crawling toward AI. We're not right. there yet. Um, did you then get involved in, I won't say the next stage, it's all a, a process, but uh, what's become known as deep learning at this stage or later on? When... Well, well, actually, I went into administration for a while. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, I, our department ran out of people who could be chairs, so I became department chair. Okay. I didn't think I would like it, but it turned out I loved it because I could make things happen right. that people didn't do before. And so I thought, doing this at the department level, maybe the dean level. Right. So I applied for the deanship when it became open and became dean of engineering. No torment of the soul about leaving the research? Uh, no, no, because I realized I could do a lot of things to help other faculty okay. and make Cornell a stronger institution. Uh, and... Uh, I, I enjoyed uh, actually administration. Well, I'm I'm not surprised by that. I can I can see your concern about human beings and 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 how to further education. But how are you keeping up with the developments in the field while oh, you are? I, so oh, I, I do. I wasn't. Oh, you uh, really weren't. No, and um, so once I finished my time as dean of engineering, right. Uh, I, I did not have the skills that I could go higher up. Uh, I mean, one of the skills you need, I mean, if you want to become a university president, yes. uh, is you've got to say all the right things. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I'm not somebody. If you ask me a question, I'm going to try to answer right. it. I'm not going to say, uh, look, that, that's an excellent question. Right. Uh, uh, which, which does bring up one other little thing is I'd had this presidential appointment uh, to be on the right. National Science Board, uh, but the second Bush asked me if I would be an Undersecretary of Commerce. And I thought that would be an interesting job. I was one of three candidates. And so I went to the White House to be interviewed. Yes. And uh, I spent a day there and I wasn't asked a single technical question. And I realized the portfolio, which looked great. It had international commerce. It had all kinds of space, uh, all kinds of things. That wasn't the job. Uh, the only questions I was asked were things like, what is your position on abortion? Uh, and uh, well, I, I got past that because I told them, look, I'm far more conservative than anybody in this room on this issue. Right. And basically... Uh, it's inappropriate for any government official to try to force his ideological position on, on the general public. You said that to them. I said that to them. And it was interesting because I looked around the room, the women in there all of a sudden smiled. They knew I had passed because that is the conservative position. Yeah. And I went on and told them, I said, I don't want the government telling me how many hours I can sleep or how many calories I can right. eat or right. what I should do. Uh, and so they realized I had passed, but it probably wasn't the answer the other two gave. Right. But another question they asked is, anything going to come up in confirmation hearing? Yes. And I said, look, I had a presidential appointment, and I was confirmed by unanimous vote of the Senate. 
And one of the staff said, John, technically you had a presidential appointment, but nobody cares who the president appoints to the National Science Board. <laughs> <laughs> this job, they do care. And the minute the president made, if you're appointed, the minimum the president makes an announcement, you're going to be shot by all kinds of people. Right. So going home, I realized this was not the job for me. Uh, first of all, it was a purely political job. Right. And secondly, if you ask me a question, I'm not going to say that that's an excellent question and go off and give a canned talk on some other topic. I'm going to try to answer it, and that, that's not the skill for this job. So I, I told them I withdrew my application. This was an opportunity you were not going to take. Yeah, but I think I would have gotten it because right. two cabinet members called me the next day and asked me why, why I had yeah. dropped. So I think... I probably would have gotten it, but it would have been a disaster. So what do you do with your life now? You turn down this opportunity. Well, uh, I decided I'm going to go back and teach and do research. Okay. And uh, Again, at Cornell. At Cornell. So uh, I, uh, I had a year off. I had a year where I could do and right. I started to look where computer science was going. Okay, because you're rusty. Right. And so I decided I'd work in social networks. Okay. And that, and from social networks, that's what drew me into uh, 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 AI. And and so all of this had happened while you were otherwise occupied. Right. Um, how excited were you about the possibilities that were now present that hadn't been earlier? Well, I'm not sure I was that excited because you know I'm now. I don't know my age actually when I was, but. Uh, I figured I was finishing my career and I would educate a few more students and, right. and that okay. would be it. You uh, had made your contribution. Right. But then some real opportunities came up. Uh, various countries started asking me if I would help them improve education. And so I worked in Vietnam, Colombia, uh, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, India, China. I was not having much success. Uh, I was helping a few students and a few faculty, but not really helping the countries until I got to China. And China was different. And the difference is the premier of China knows that he's got to improve education. Yes. Uh, and basically one of the things he said in one of the first meetings I had with him, he says, our highest priority is stability of the country. And to do that, we've got to raise uh, the standard of living faster than people's expectations go up. And to do that, we've got to increase the gross national product. Right. And to do that, we've got to improve university education. We're talking in general. We're not talking about education within the sciences or education about no. computers in general. In general. Okay. Uh, but um, I initially started, the Ministry of Education hired me to help them improve a, a thousand second and third tier universities. And they would pick a city where there would be 50 universities within close distance and they'd bring in faculty and I would work with these faculty to try to upgrade their skills. Right. But I quickly learned it wasn't working uh, because the metrics by which these faculty were evaluated yes. was how much research money they brought in and how many papers they published. Yes. And so I told the Ministry of Education, this isn't worth it, we're wasting our money, let's, let's stop. But I think one thing that helped me is uh, since I had the Turing Award, they thought they were going to have to negotiate a large consulting fee. And when they wanted to negotiate it, I said, look, I don't consult for money. And I said, don't hire people who want a large consulting fee because they'll be around uh, while you're paying them and then they'll be gone. But there are a lot of people like me who are older and would like to have a significant impact. And if this job will have a significant impact, I'll do it for nothing. Just cover my expenses. And after they... Uh, came back up from the floor, uh, well, they were pleased to hear this? Well, they were pleased to hear it, but I suspect they passed that message up because when I resigned, I was approached by the president of one of the top universities, and he said, look, uh, a better strategy would be if I would become a counselor to him okay. and help him improve Shanghai Zhaotong University. And then they could train PhD students who could be faculty members at other universities, and uh, this would be a better strategy. 
And so I agreed to that job. And uh, as I started working with them, I chaired their faculty recruiting committee. And I was bringing people in, but after two years, they were leaving. And so I interviewed them and said, why? And they said, the environment here is so bad, we're not interested. The and environment the, for research? For doing research and, and good teaching. Okay. And developing their professional reputation. Okay. Because uh, presidents of universities in China uh, are five year are government employees, they have a five year term, and they'll get another job. And they want to move up, like maybe become Minister of Education or right. something. So what they do is they try to raise, increase the research funding and the number of papers published. And they say, can say, look, at the university, I raised the research funding 15% and so on. But doing this, they put so much pressure on junior faculty that the faculty don't, there's no reward structure for teaching and, and for doing uh, in fact, to raise the money, the only way they can do it is working for a senior faculty member. And you're not going to do world-class research if you're working for a senior faculty Staying member. Staying within the, the climate that you were discovering, uh, yeah. the intellectual climate, at least some places, right. um, there's always the famous question, because these days people look at China and they look at the United States as frameworks, not only of education, but of right. original research. Um, is this question of the originality of research or the encouragement of it one of the key questions in? Oh, it's an important question uh, because uh, China has 20% of the population, right. the U.S. 5%. Right. Uh, and if you believe talent is uniformly distributed, like I do, China has 20% of the talent. Right. The trouble is, is the opportunity is not there. Okay. And by the way, the premier is well aware of this. And he wants to change the metrics of universities. But when he tells people to do it, the lower level people change what he tells them right. to this do and nothing happens. Right. Uh, but I think he discovered me and saw that I was trying to do what he wanted done. And so he started inviting my wife and I over to advise him and have dinner with him in the People's right. Great Hall. In fact, right. four times. Right. Uh, and I got the highest award that China will give to a foreigner. I became a foreign member of the Chinese Academy of right. Science. And one meeting, uh, the premier just wanted to see me for 15 seconds so he could televise nationally our shaking hands. Yeah, yeah. He was sending a message to lower level government officials. But uh, still, the fundamental conditions for research, I mean, isn't there an overwhelming amount that needs to be done to change oh. an intellectual climate? No, I, I think it's relatively simple. Okay. Uh, I think if university presidents are told that their next job is going to depend on how much they improve the quality of undergraduate education, it'll happen overnight. Uh, the university presidents are very knowledgeable, very talented people, and they're very capable. And, but they're focused on their next job. Right. And if all of a sudden their opportunity changes, uh, I think things will happen. What about graduate education? Oh, so people ask me about this. Why am I focusing on undergraduate? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> if they improve the undergraduate program, there'll be all of a sudden the, the students going into the PhD program will be much better. And uh, this will improve the PhD program. And also, the junior faculty who are now working for senior faculty won't be working for senior faculty. They'll be working for themselves. Right. They'll be doing what excites them. And the PhD program, I think, will uh, evolve. By the, by the way, I chaired uh, uh, an international committee on how to improve education in China. Right. And basically, uh, when you get a report to the premier, it can be at most one page, right. <laughs> which gets you to really right. focus. And uh, we decided, what was the one thing in education? And this is what we felt as undergraduate. Uh, it'll also help the, the high school education, because in the high school, uh, they're not educating students. They're focused on getting them to get a good score on the exam to get into college. Right. And if, because they want to get into one of the top colleges. Right. But if the 1,500 universities are all improved, then uh, high school students may feel it's not 
so critical that they get into Xinhua or Peking or Shanghai yeah. Xiaotong, uh, they can go to a local school and get a good Something education. Is, and I know this is not yeah. a contradictory comment, but just uh, a related one. Something is happening, back to artificial intelligence, where uh, the Chinese economy and interest right. is exploding with interest and capacity and right. response. So something is going right. Right. Oh, when China wants to do something, uh, they can do it. Uh, and uh, they are going to fix AI. Uh, what, what, what is fixing AI? Well, there are local communities, Shenzhen, Hangzhou, and Nanjing. Uh, each of those, the, the local community, has put $250 million into building AI centers. Okay. Now, I think a lot of money is going to be wasted, but uh, when you have that kind of resource, they're going to build AI. And there are companies over there, uh, Baidu, Tencent, uh, uh, ByteDance, these, right. these have built AI labs and they are, they are doing uh, world-class work. Maybe it's, it's not the research that's going to advance AI. Ah. But it's the research that's going to make their companies profitable. Well, I, I attended a recent lecture yeah. where the premise was that in the era of big data, right, that China has unique advantages, at least entrepreneurial right. advantages. Right. Would you agree? Uh, there are many economists who say there are only two countries that are going to profit from the information age. And one of them is China, the other is the United States. And to succeed, you have to have data. And China has it, and the United States has it. I mean, when you do a search, the search engine saves all of your searches. Right. Uh, and because I fly to China on Delta, uh, when I bring up some website, all of a sudden there's an ad for Delta, right. uh, Ithaca, Beijing. Right. You know, uh, people know a lot about me. Right. Uh, and you and think their companies are comparable I actually oh, they probably have more information well, that's what I was saying that okay. actually more information and more um, tolerance for maybe even risk right. taking right uh, I mean WeChat it has a tremendous amount of information right uh, uh, so again to return to theory I, I understand that that you're in this if you will world-changing role in terms of education but in terms of right now where AI is, um, is significant research happening in China? Um, it, not of the really fundamental. Um, it, it, the United States clearly has a lead there. But most of the research in AI has to do with applications. Okay. And there, I think they're going to outperform us. Where is our research now, right? Where, what are the interesting nodes of research in AI in the United States? Oh, I would say 90% of it is in applications like making self-driving vehicles, uh, face recognition. I mean, face recognition is now good. Uh, and uh, replacing, well, uh, uh, administrative assistants may disappear. They may become computers. Uh, that, that's where the action is because that's where the money is. Well, does the theorist in you despair that enough uh, inquiry is not going or curiosity attached to the theoretical element? Um, there are very few theor theoreticians in AI. Huh. Uh, and one of the things AI right now is pattern recognition in high dimensional space. Right. Um, if you show uh, a deep learning network, something that looks like a bicycle, but does not have the function of a bicycle, right. it'll still say it's a bicycle. Right. Well, you'll say, no, that's not a bicycle. I can't get on it and pedal over to the right. subway stop. It won't work, right. Yeah, and so we don't know how to extract the function. There, there's a lot of things we don't know. Right. But, but we can do many things without knowing that. But when we worry, and this will be toward the end of our conversation, when we worry, don't we worry, maybe over-worry, that we will figure out a way to make computers oh, humanly intelligent? Oh, that, that's probably going to come, except I don't know what human intelligence is anymore. I used to define it as the ability to solve complex problems. Right. 
But I realize now you can solve complex problems without intelligence with just computing power. Oh. And so we need a new definition of intelligence. But let, let me just add one, yeah. one more thing. Um, China, if it raises its standard of living, it will have to increase its gross national product by a factor of four or five. And it's, gonna, it's, its gross national product will be four times that of the U.S. And it's going to become the world's power. Uh, I mean, all of the countries are close to it are going to be trading with it. And the U.S. ought to be building a positive relationship with mm -hmm. China, uh, just like we have with Europe. I mean, we're going to become one world. We don't want to be China over there and the U.S. here. We want the U.S. and China to really integrate. I feel uh, that's a message you're sending Washington as well as... <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, people have to realize we are going to become one world. Right. Uh, you could get to any city anywhere in the world probably within 24 hours from here. Right. And if you just want to talk to somebody there, you could do it within a few minutes. You could figure out how to do it. Right. Uh, and um, you know, we were a country of immigration, and, and our birth rate is not sufficient to maintain the population. Right. Uh, so immigration is important. Uh, and it also has to do with age distribution. It's important. So um, it's important that we have not only a science education for people, but also a broader education so they'll understand how to make the the world a better place for everybody and for our children and grandchildren. That's the last word. Thank yeah. you.